So if we look at this as an individual, so the same equation, but now rather than writing this in matrix form, we're saying here's the phenotype of the JS individual. This is the effect of the IS SNP. This is the genotype of the IS SNP in the JS individual. And then here's the environmental effect of that JS individual. And the reason I'm writing this out like this is because while this model looks really easy, and this is really what we want to do, it unfortunately has to be a little bit more complicated. And this right here is that model I just showed you. And everything over here in this equation we call covariates. So for instance, if I'm looking at height, how much is age affected by genotype? It's like not, right? You're alive, you get older every day. But as people get older, they also tend to get taller up until they're really old, in which case they get shorter. But in general, as people get older and older, they get taller and taller, especially when young. And so when we estimate for an individual how tall they are, and we're trying to figure out the effect of genetics, we kind of want to take out the effect of age. Also, like girls tend to be a little shorter than boys, so we also want to take out that sex difference. Also, there's this huge problem that we kind of mentioned in a previous module of population structure or of these like confounders that we don't really know about. And I'm gonna leave this for a separate module as well. But a lot of times when people are doing a GWAS, you'll hear them say that we regressed out the first PCs, the first 20 PCs, the first two PCs, something like that. And what they're referring to are what are called principal components. And these are the principal components of the genotype matrix. If that means nothing to you, don't worry about it. What you really need to know is that principal components capture population structure. So like, if you look at Europeans and you take a whole bunch of Europeans and you look at their genotype matrix and calculate the first two principal components, um, you can then like make a plot of Europe and the people will show up on that plot looking like Europe. So the first principal component basically tells you how far north and south you are in Europe, and left and right is given, or east and west is given by the second principal component. And so what these guys do is they remove that sort of population structure, because it could be that most of your cases are from like northern Europe, and most of your controls are from southern Europe, and then you might get like the lactose gene showing up which possibly has nothing to do with the trait you're interested in, but it happens to be that people in Northern Europe have a higher prevalence of the lactose gene, and people in Southern Europe have a lower prevalence. And so you might get differences that are just due to population structure and not due to actually the genetics having an effect on why. But by using the principal components, you remove that problem. Not super important to understand unless you're doing GWAS yourself, in which case you'll learn much more about this. Um, so, and because this is less important, I'm going to stop showing it for the rest of the thing. But just be aware that when people say they controlled covariates like age and sex and PCs, that's what they're doing. All right. But from this, there's some terminology we need to learn. First of all, the true effect. If you ever see a beta with an I and there's no hat on top, it's representing the true effect. Unless you're doing a simulation study, you will never ever know what the true effect is. You will only ever have an estimate of the true effect, which should, if people are using good notation, have this hat on top of it. And all this means is that this is an estimate for what this value is in reality. So when we do GWAS, we take our phenotype like height, we regress it one by one on each variant in the genome, and we get these beta hat estimates. And along with the beta hats, we get p-values. And a lot of times when a GWAS happens, you're gonna see this plot. It gets referred to as a Manhattan plot because in theory, this looks like the skyline of Manhattan. And, uh, and these, on this plot, the x-axis represents the position. So here you have like chromosome one, two, three, all the way through 22. And so each dot represents a different variant that was tested when they did the GWAS. And the y-axis is the negative log 10 of the p-value. And so as this value gets higher, it's like having a smaller and smaller and smaller p-value. So 
since we have a p-value, we obviously have to have a null hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis. <coughs> so our null is that our genotype has no estimated effect on the phenotype. And our alternate is that our, geno our genotype has a non-zero estimated effect. So question for the crowd, why do I say that it has a non-zero estimated effect as my alternate as opposed to a non-zero effect? Say any of my true considering we don't know confounding and things like that. Right? Yeah, exactly. So we don't know what the confounding is. It could be that some SNP that has a significant p-value, it might just be an LD with something else that's causal. So I don't want to say that this SNP has a non-zero effect. I just want to say that the effect that we observed from this SNP like our estimate happens to be non-zero, and I don't want to necessarily say why that estimate is non-zero. I just want to say, like, whatever this beta was that I got for it is significantly not zero. And I don't want to interpret the meaning of that. 